So does it make sense to fund one policy as long as you possibly can? Or does it make sense to fund multiple policies for a short period of time in order to maximize the internal rate of return? The simple question is, when it comes to whole life insurance policies designed for maximum cash value, what's the best way to get the most, most out of my money, the best bang for your buck, if you want to call it that? So we're going to provide some more detail here uh, just to provide a background uh, to this question, uh, specifically when we hear this question, because we've heard it for a number of years. With a cash value life insurance policy, if you fund a policy for a short period of time, let's call it 10 years or less, seven years or less will really do the trick for you. But in this example, we're gonna look at 10 years or less, you will maximize the internal rate of return. Meaning you'll see a higher net growth rate on cash value in a policy where you max fund it, call it for 10 years and then stop, compared to one where you keep pumping money into a policy. So that's an advantage. A disadvantage though, whenever we start a new policy, what happens? We've got to go through the new expenses again. So what we're going to look at in this case study is as follows. We're going to look at a 35-year-old male in two different products. The first option, number one, a traditional whole life 100 policy. A whole life, one, whole life 100 product means that you can make payments literally up until the age of 100. Now what we're going to look at specifically is funding up until the age of, of 65. So 30 years at $100,000 per year, one policy, go through underwriting, underwriting one time, go through the initial expenses one time, one and done. Compared to number two, we're going to look at a limited pay product, specifically a 10 pay policy. Now a 10 pay policy means that one can pay into the product only for 10 years. After the 10th year, even if I want to get money into that policy, I cannot. I would have to start a new policy at that point in time. So what we're gonna look at here is starting at the same age, 35, 100K per year for 10 years, and then stop. Let that policy just cook, continue to grow, and then continue to pay $100,000 per year, but now I'm starting a new policy at age 45, 100K per year for 10 years. Repeat the same process. Up until age 55, I stop the second one. The first one's still compounding for me. Age 55, another 100K per year for 10 years, and then stop at age 65. So in both examples, we're paying in out of pocket, if this is you, $100,000 per year for 30 years, total of $3 million. The difference in the strategy is option one, it's one policy, you go through underwriting one time, the initial insurance expenses only one time and just keep feeding the beast. Versus option two, you're taking out a new policy every 10 years. And which one is going to yield greater results? That is the question. So I wanna recap a couple things I briefly touched on, touched on there, but I wanna go through this more thoroughly. With the Life 100 product, again, this is one policy, you can fund it as long as you'd like up until age 100. So the major advantage to this traditional whole life insurance policy is that I have to go through the initial insurance expenses only one time. That's it when I first start a policy. We're gonna go through exactly how premium and PUA dollars work with the Whole Life 100 product and the 10 pay product. But I've only gotta go through that once. After the second year, all of my dollars, premium and PUA dollars are all coming back to work for me and get stronger and stronger with time. So the initial expenses, I only go through once and I can keep feeding the policy, keep feeding the beast I like to refer to it as. Versus the 10 pay policy. So here's the advantage to this, and this has really been the case since the recent 7702 change in the industry with the adjustment of guaranteed rates and how cash values uh, accumulate in different policies and such. But you'll see with limited pay products, the highest internal rate of return with most companies, not with all, but with most companies. We're going to focus on mass mutual examples today just to keep everything apples to apples. So the advantage, highest internal rate of return, disadvantage, I can only pay into it for 10 years, which means what? Well, if this is me and I want to keep funding it after the 10th year, what would happen? I now have to take out a new policy and go through new expenses again. Is that in my best interest? That's the question. And some key points of awareness here too, is there's some unknown elements. One, will my health change over time? That happens. We all think often, hey, I'm gonna be healthy forever. 
me. I'm going to keep running every day, but life happens. Who knows what will happen to us at the end of the day? If our health deteriorates, we go with the 10 pay strategy, say 10 years from now, I'm no longer ultra healthy, getting the best health rating. Maybe I'm uninsurable because I had a, a severe health issue that, that I encountered, whatever it might be, that can impact the strategy. So I want to be aware of that. Also, another thing that I want to be aware of that is out of my control is product changes. Product changes do occur over time. We just had a huge product revamp as a result of the 7702 change in the industry, but we had one in 2020 with the new mortality table update. And companies are always updating their products. So the point to mentioning that is the numbers that you see today are based on today's current products with one insurance company. Down the road, things will change. They always do. So these are some important pieces just to provide more awareness that I would want to know if I'm you, if I'm the consumer. So again, the key question here is with the 10 pay product, Will the higher internal rate of return, because you will see stronger cash value growth with the 10 pay compared to a tr traditional product, will that higher internal rate of return exceed the new expenses that I have to undertake every 10 years? Because when you start a new policy, I've got to go through the initial expenses. I've got to hit the break-even point. I'm going to have less money up front than what I pay into the policy. And we want to measure that stuff so we can make a true accurate, informed decision. So some transparency here. What we're going to look at here, same company, same dividend crediting rate, Mass Mutual's 2022 dividend interest rate is 6%. Same design, 1090 split, both with the Whole Life 100 product and the, and the 10 pay product. So with Mass Mutual, they will permit any and all of their products to carry a minimum base premium of 10%. 1090 split, so over $100,000, $10,000 would be directed toward the base premium. Different products, Whole Life 100 and 10 pay. The guaranteed rates are different. So if we were to shoot this video last year, things would be much, much different where we would have a consistent guaranteed rate of 4% across the board. And why this is important without talking about the guaranteed values, is when you adjust guaranteed rates on whole life insurance products, the MEC limits will be adjusted. So the examples you'll see will be an apples to apples comparison when focusing on the hash value. However, when comparing a whole life 100 and a 10 pay product with a 3.75% guaranteed rate and a 2% guaranteed rate, what you will find is the higher the guaranteed rate is, the more death benefit I need to attain that same MEC limit. If that makes sense, we've got some additional content on that as well in our 77, 7702 series videos. But you will see different death benefits here, but the products are designed with minimum insurance expenses for maximum cash values because we do have the same MEC limit. So before we get into the numbers, let's set the foundation with respect to the policy design. So here's something we talk about quite a bit. When you are going to direct any amount of money into a life insurance policy, you, the policyholder, and the agent you're working with can decide where your money goes. It can go toward one of two primary areas, the premium or the PUA rider. We also have a term insurance rider here. This is a great advantage. We attach this, in this example, we attach it to both policies. We almost always use this as it does generate more cash value on a guaranteed and non-guaranteed basis. But I'll refer to this as the premium as well. Money can go toward, call it primary insurance expenses or toward this paid up additions rider. With a whole life 100 product, where's the money going? If it's $10,000, 10% of the total $100,000, what will happen with that $10,000 is you will see zero or very close to zero show up in cash value in both the first and the second year. With a traditional whole life insurance policy, the insurance company is going to overcharge me for the cost of insurance upfront, the death benefit, so we see $760,000. But as you continue to make those premium payments, what you will find is in the third year and from that point forward, this 10,000 begins to come back to work for you, begins to earn the guaranteed rate, shows up in guaranteed cash value, begins to earn dividends, and it gets better and better as time passes. Now, we also attach a term insurance rider 
let's call it a thousand bucks, cost a little bit more in the examples that we ran. We're going to go through the specific costs too. But the purpose of that term insurance rider is that is a cheap way, if you don't like the word cheap, a cost effective way to add more death benefit, which raises our MEC limit to the dollar figure that we need. So what has a direct relationship to that MEC limit on a life insurance policy? We want to prevent detectable events. So we do not want our policy to become classified as a MEC. Our, an individual's age and total death benefit are the primary factors. So by adding term insurance, this is a very, very inexpensive method to add more death benefit, which raises the MEC limit, lets me keep my premium low, which does not show up in cash value, and then plow more money into PUAs because I see that show up in cash value. That's money I can access right away, begins to compound. This is the key to maximizing the cash value on a life insurance policy. And with a whole life 100 product, PUA dollars will buy you more death benefit. For a 35 year old male, it will fall between three and four X that payment. So if I pay in $90,000 into PUAs, I might see, call it another $350,000 or so actually show up in cash value, 350 to 400. I mean, if I pay 90,000 into PUAs, I'd see that in cash value minus PUA fees. There's a fee that's carried with it. And then I'd see between 350,000 and $400,000 show up in additional death benefit as a result. So that's the whole life 100 product. Progressing on to the 10 pay product. Here's how it works. So same fundamentals here when we design the policy. What we've got, $10,000 base premium, because Mass Mutual in this particular example allows us to go as low as 10% on the base premium with respect to the total payment. The base premium does not function like a whole life 100 product. I'll typically see between 30 and 35% of that base premium show up in cash value in the first year alone. Beginning the second year, I see almost all of it come back to cash value. So this product in itself, premium dollars, credit more to cash value right off the bat. Now, what do you notice when you look at the death benefit? Much less than the whole life 100 product. So the premium, because I can only pay into it for 10 years, will naturally purchase me less death benefit than a product where I can pay into it up until age 100. So if you're in the position where you say, hey, I don't really care about the death benefit, not right now at least, I'm interested in cash value, that's why I'm researching this, why is that important? Well, the death benefit has a direct relationship to what? Remember that guy? The MEC limit, that taxable line on a life insurance policy. So we do the same thing, attaching a term rider, cost-effective way to raise the death benefit, and then it gives us more MEC space at the end of the day. And then PUA dollars show up in cash value. And with a 10-pay product, because the guaranteed rate is lower, PUA dollars do buy you some more death benefit, but instead of 3 to 4x, it would only be about 2x, which is different from what things looked like back when we had a 4% guaranteed rate. A lot of fun stuff, right? Let's look at some numbers here. So what we will begin with is a whole life 100 product. So before we just jump into the spreadsheet, we want to go through all of the validation points. Here we go. Whole life 100. Where is the money going? Just like the whiteboard presentation we went through, it can go, go where? Premium or the PUA component. Here's the breakdown with respect to where his money's going. Base policy insurance. That's your base premium. Gives you an initial death benefit for a 35-year-old male. He's 36 at the end of the first year, but gives you an initial death benefit of $765,000. And then this guy, his term insurance, which we added to the policy, cost-effective method to raise the death benefit, which primarily raises our MEC limit, which is just over 100,000 in this example. Now we see 5,000 here. The cost of the term is not $5,000. It's right around a thousand bucks actually. That this rider here, this LISR, it's a great way to build in flexibility with mass mutual policies, but it's a combination of money going toward PUAs and a one year term insurance rider. And then Ayler is mass mutual's terminology for their pure PUA rider. Okay, so here, 100K goes in, here's my money column, 
net cash value end year, got about $84,000 in cash value. Now you paid close to $90,000 in PUAs, but only 84%, call it, showed up in cash value right off the bat. Why not the full amount? That question comes up sometimes. The reason why is with all companies, we have PUA fees. As PUA dollars do purchase us some additional death benefit as well. That's a big reason why a fee is attached there, but there are PUA fees which do show up or they hurt the most, let's call it that way, call it that in the first year. Why I say they hurt the most in the first year is because after the first year, the policy begins to compound, receive the guaranteed rate, dividends, and that quickly puts my money to work for me, which offsets the, the cost of the fees. But there are fees. If you'd like more information on that, uh, let us know. We do have videos that are not public for compliance reasons, but we go through the full breakdown of how PUA rider fees work. But that's why I have less than the 89,000 I paid in the PUAs showing up in cash value right off the bat. So we look at this, 100K per year, breaking even, just about year six, I've paid in $600,000. I've got 598, year seven, I'm positive. Now, if you've watched our older videos, the, the equivalent to this product, the old Legacy 100 product with the same design, would almost always break even year five. Why it's just about year six now is a result of those higher PUA fees, which is good to be aware of there. Death benefit, $3 million, which gives us a MEC limit. Bottom right hand corner, right there just over 100,000 in this example. And we paid money, and we fund this policy for 30 years, 100K per year. Death benefit keeps on growing. Cash value keeps growing quite nicely as well. Got about 5.7 at the end of it. And there's our cash value column. So that's our whole life 100 product. The advantage to this policy, going back to the case study that we're looking at, is in this example, at year 10, instead of getting a new policy, I can continue to pump money into the product. So the specific advantage is this. Think of it this way. This is you and you say, hey, I can start a new policy, go through the early years again, go through the initial insurance expenses, or at year 11, I can pay $100,000 in, and when I look at my cash value over here, grows from 1.1 to 1.25 which means I got my $100,000 back and just about another $40,000 on top of it. So I do not have to take a negative hit, I see my money working for me. So that's the attraction there to being able to continue to pump money into a policy. Then when we look at the 10 pay product, perfect. Okay, where's the money going? So we used a renewable term insurance rider here because with a 10 pay product, you cannot achieve, with a mass mutual 10, 10 pay product, you cannot achieve a 1090 split with their lister rider. So here, base premium, we wanted to keep the true 1090 split equivalent. Scheduled Ailer, which is their PUA rider, just about 89K. Renewable term rider, which is actually a level term rider, the premium is level for the first 10 years in this example, of about 1.7. Death benefits less, but the MEC limits are very similar. MEC limits actually a little above $120,000 in this example. We overinflated it to make sure we never ran into a long-term MEC, or particularly after the 10th year, because we're funding it longer than seven years. I know I add some technical stuff in there. I'm trying to keep things simple, but I've got the urge to go into all of the details. My OCD. <laughs> so where do you notice the initial difference? First year cash value on the whole life 100 product was what? 84,000, what do we see here? 89.5, almost 89.6. Why so much of a difference? About a $5,000 difference, a little bit more. The reason why, number one, base premium dollars, we get about 3,300, we can see it there, that shows up in cash value in the first year. The second reason is Limited pay products, Mass Mutual's 10 pay product, has PUA rider fees, but they are lower than the Whole Life 100 product. Mass Mutual's 10 pay and 15 pay product have lower PUA fees than all of their other products, which is a big reason why. Um, and they did come out and say that these policies are designed more for cash accumulation 
rather than death benefit. But what do we see here? 35 year old male, by year four, he's breaking even. He's paid in 400, he has 400. Based on the current dividend rate, this will change. We've run some studies where we kick the dividend rate down to 5% and that'll push the break even to about year five in this particular example. But after 10 years, I got 1.183, pay nothing in, cash value continues to grow, but I cannot pay more money in. Versus the whole life 100, I can decide to keep going or I can stop. This, I'm forced to stop. So, the question is now, when he turns 45, he says, okay, now I want to start a new policy where we repeat the same process. There's the 10K base premium, term rider, a little bit higher now, I need less term. The older you grow, you need less death benefit for the same MEC limit, so you'll notice the death benefit is less each time because the constant goal was maximizing cash value, keeping everything apples to apples. There's your PUA payment. What do you notice here? 100K in, cash value 88.5, because the term rider is a little bit more. The base premium is the same. Same thing with the base premium credit right off the bat. Break even between years four and five. And then we did the same thing at age 55. Rather than flip back and forth with different illustrations, we simplify this by laying it all out on Excel. Took me a little bit of time, but I thoroughly enjoy it. So it's, quite, so it's a lot of fun. So here we go. What do we have here? We've got the 10 pay policy starting at age 35 starting at age 45, and then starting at age 55, all side by side. All policies designed for maximum cash value. We juiced it with a maximum PUA allocation, $10,000 base premium, and there you go. You do notice age has a little bit of a role here with the internal rate of return and break even. It's not huge though. I mean, the break even is year four at 35, and then year five at 55 assuming all things are equal with a policy designed for maximum cash value. If this was just a seven pay, we would actually be able to increase that a little bit. Internal rates of return, when we look at these, these are annualized IRRs, not the average, so it isolates what we're earning each year. If we look at, let's look at year 15 at age 50, 5% when I started at age 35, 4.97 if I started at 45, and 4.9 if I started at 55. It's a slight difference, right? About a 10 basis point spread if I'm starting 20 years later with all things being equal, but not a huge difference. Again, because we're laser focused here on how to maximize the cash value. So here's what we did. First, we put everything side by side in this format. You've got on the left, age 35, there's the 100K for 10 years and then we stop. You'll also notice a death benefit drop there because we dropped the term insurance rider at that point in time. Here, this is starting at age 45, so year one starts at 45. Funding it, there we go. This is, these are the exact same numbers we just looked at. On the far right, combined values. Makes life a lot easier, right? <laughs> so, what you'll see, there's year 10. And now, year 11 through 20, that 100K per year is the new policy, the second policy, this guy right here. So we're gonna use those combined values and compare them directly to that whole life 100. Let's take a look at that next. What we've got here, on the left, the whole life, one pro whole life 100 product, which is the policy we started with, the fir first illustration, and then the second, slide here is the 10 pay policies, all three of them combined, the combined values over time. So as we look at these side by side, first 10 years, the 10 pay is going to produce more cash value. The product is designed for cash accumulation, more money credits, more money of the base premium credits toward cash value. The first 10 years is the winner. If you said, hey, I'm gonna fund this for 10 years or less, or I'm gonna fund it for five or seven years, with Mass Mutual, their 10 pay or 15 pay product would be the way to go, in my opinion, for a max cash value uh, play. 
But as we look at this here, so first 10 years, let's look at the difference. As we just look at the total cash value, 1,107, whereas over here, you've got $1,183,000. So I've got significantly more cash value, same company, same dividend rate, same health rating, all that good stuff, more money up front. So focusing on the short term, the first 10 years, you will find we've got significantly more money or greater value with that 10 pay product. Right off the bat, look at the cash value difference, about $5,600 and by year 10, $76,000 or more. But then here comes the main question. When I hit year 11, what happens? We're starting a new policy. What's the worst part about a whole life insurance policy? The first year is the worst year. I have to go through the initial insurance expenses again. So keep in mind of this. What is my cash value growing by each year? When I st start a new policy, the new policy will experience a negative 10% IRR, closer to negative 11% actually in this case. The question is, will the compounding from the first policy exceed the costs on the new one? So what was your increase here? 3.99 to 4.11. What's it jump to, jump to to the next year? Let's take a look. Here we go. Interesting, isn't it? So what happened to your cash value? If we start with the internal rate of return, let's take this one column at a time here. With the existing policy, it increased. Now this is combined value, so it's factoring in the IRR increase from the, the first policy that we have, but then starting a new policy, we've got a negative hit. So when I combine them, my annual IRR is positive 3.71 compared to the whole life 100 at 3.54. Interesting. So I see right here in the short term still makes more sense with that 10 pay strategy. The cash value difference, look at this, which matches up with the IRR. Grew by about $11,000 or $11,000, that was the increase. Now here, see it slowed down a little bit, closer to four, almost $5,000 because of the new expenses with the new policy. That's why when I see a, a new policy, it's like I'm going, I'm going fast, 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 I gotta go over a little speed bump quick, slow down, and then can start to pick up the pace again, if that makes sense. Let's continue on here. Through year 20, what do we notice? Did the whole life 100 start to catch up at all? No. 10 pay products kept on pulling, pulling away. Let's look at the last series here, starting the third policy. Now we're assuming his health remains the same and he can keep getting new policies. Now, if his health rating was a non-smoker here, you would still see it come out ahead. There's too much of a gap here. But if he's uninsurable and he can't pay any more money in, well then A, he wouldn't be able to pay anything in or he'd have to look to put a policy on someone else. We'd have to start to get creative and look at alternatives. But as we look at this, do we notice a difference here? Or what's the answer to the question? Does it make sense to have one large policy where I keep feeding it? Or look at this strategy where I can max fund it to enhance the internal rate of return and then start a new one. There's a big, big difference here. And keep in mind, these are illustrations, but they're with the same company, same design. All things are apples to apples in that respect. We're not showing one company compared to another or anything like that. As we look at the end, bringing this home, what do we notice? We ran this through age 100. Both are solid options. I mean, you paid in three million bucks and look at the difference here. <laughs> 29,000 and change, death benefit in Dow's, but there is a difference there, significant. And this is a difference in cash value. So being laser focused on the cash value, we see that that 10 pay strategy, because it is designed for cash accumulation, gives me more value. Death benefit depends on the timing. So there's your big, big difference. And this is a result of the 7702 change and guaranteed rates that are associated with different whole life insurance products. We go through this a lot in our training business when we train agents and such. But DB difference. So this represents here how much more or less I have in death benefit with the combined 10 pay policies versus the whole life 100 product. So right off the bat, about a million dollars less. 
What if I go down to year 30? Look at this. It's about $3 million. I'm sorry, $2 million. Next year, it jumps to $3 million because of that uh, drop in the term insurance rider. Now, as time passes, as your cash accumulates, death benefit grows with it, eventually, you will see a policy that has stronger cash value long term that'll have a stronger death benefit as well. You see that every single time. But these are th some things I do want to consider. That death benefit has a lot of value there. I might look at that and say, hey, if I die at age 60, I mean, that's almost two and a half million dollars in difference of value that's not paid income tax free when I, when I went with this strategy. Maybe I combine both of these options. Maybe I go with the traditional policy with mass, and then I look at a guardian policy. We often refer to their sweet spot if I want a 1090 split, funding for 10 years or less with that flexible PUA as we look at different options. And that's just me going back to talking too much about cash value life insurance. But very interesting when we look at this. So the answer to the question with keeping all things apples to apples with one particular life insurance company, it makes sense actually to maximize the internal rate of return and look at multiple policies. But I wanna keep these things in mind as well because there will, will be things that occur that are outside of everyone's control. The consumer, the agent, the industry, the industry is going to change it. Insurance companies are going to change the products. They always have, they always will as time passes. And that will impact the outcome of what we saw there. So in our next video, we're gonna look at some older products actually with a 4% guaranteed rate because for years, what we just went through there, that was not the case. When all things are equal with the same guaranteed interest rate and MEC limits are identical, it'll be the opposite, where one large policy will actually outweigh or outperform multiple policies. So for people that have been in the business for a while, including myself, we're used to working a muscle repetition so many times, right? Whenever that question was asked, hey, should I go with one policy or just max fund for a short period of time? Take out another one. If I'm interested in that, one policy made more sense almost every single time because all things were equal with the guaranteed rates, MEC limits, all that fun stuff. Now the game has changed a bit. So now we've got to study it and understand what is truly in the consumer's best interest based on what they're trying to accomplish. So I hope you enjoyed this one. I had a ton of fun going through this, ton of fun building it out. Um, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, and uh, feel free to reach out anytime. And as always, I hope this helps. Thanks so much. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.